Gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD. Gastroesophageal reflux disease is one of the most common gastrointestinal disorders seen by both primary care physicians and gastroenterologists and it occurs in about 10 to 20 percent of patients in the western world. Development of GERD is highly associated with being overweight or obese. GERD is a condition that develops when the reflux of stomach contents causes troublesome symptoms or certain complications often due to incompetence of the lower esophageal sphincter. Symptoms most typically include heartburn and regurgitation. When we talk about reflux of gastric contents back into the esophagus, it is not always that the reflux is pathologic as some degree of reflux is physiologic too. Physiologic reflux typically occurs postprandially and are short-lived, asymptomatic, and rarely occur during sleep. Pathologic reflux is associated with symptoms or mucosal injury and often occurs nocturnally. GERD is classified based on the appearance of the esophageal mucosa on upper endoscopy into erosive esophagitis and non-erosive reflux disease. Erosive esophagitis is characterized endoscopically as visible breaks in the distal esophageal mucosa with or without troublesome symptoms of GERD. Whereas on the other hand, non-erosive reflux disease or Endoscopy negative reflux disease is characterized by the presence of troublesome symptoms of GERD without visible esophageal mucosal injury. The prevalence of GERD was found to be about 10 to 20 percent in the Western world and less than 5 percent in Asia. So, what are the etiological factors responsible for GERD? Transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxations is the main mechanism behind the development of reflux disease. The dysfunctional LES loosens independent of swallowing and has a decreased ability to constrict, which allows stomach contents to regurgitate back into the esophagus due to sphincter insufficiency. Some of the important risk factors or associations with GERD include smoking, caffeine, and alcohol consumption, stress, obesity, pregnancy, the angle of his enlargement, itrogenic causes, and sliding hiatal hernia. Smoking, caffeine, and alcohol consumption decrease the LES tone, whereas alcohol also has toxic inflammatory effects on the esophageal mucosa and decreases the esophageal motility. Coffee increases stomach acid production and due to repeated bouts of reflux, the esophageal mucosa is subject to chemical injury due to the stomach acid. Stress also increases stomach acid production. GERD may be seen in a majority of individuals due to increased intra-abdominal pressure as seen in patients who are obese. GERD is present in up to 80% of pregnant women due to increased abdominal pressure and decreased LES tone. The lower esophageal sphincter tone is decreased due to high estrogen and progesterone levels during pregnancy. Another important factor that contributes towards GERD in pregnant patients is prolonged gastric emptying resulting from affected gastric motility. The angle of his is an angle that is formed between the esophagus and the gastric fundus. In healthy adults, it is about 50 to 60 degrees, whereas in infants, usually they have an undeveloped flat angle of his. Therefore, the regurgitation of stomach contents after meals is a common and physiological finding during the first 12 months of life. Post-surgical procedures after gastrectomy due to iatrogenic causes can also cause GERD symptoms and about 90% of patients have severe GERD in patients having sliding hiatal hernia. The classic symptoms of GERD are heartburn, which is called pyrosis, and regurgitation. 
Heartburn is typically described as a burning sensation within the retrosternal area most commonly experienced in the postprandial period and regurgitation. Patients typically regurgitate acidic material mixed with small amounts of undigested food. Dysphagia is common in the setting of long-standing heartburn and is often attributable to reflux esophagitis but can be indicative of an esophageal stricture. Odinophagia is an unusual symptom of GERD but when present usually indicates an esophageal ulcer. Other symptoms of GERD include dysphagia, chest pain, a water brash, globus sensation, odinophagia, extraesophageal symptoms like chronic cough, hoarseness, wheezing, and infrequently there can be nausea as well. The histopathological findings vary depending on the severity of the mucosal damage. Superficial coagulative necrosis in the non keratinized squamous epithelium, thickening of the basal cell layer, elongation of the papillae in the lamina propria and dilation of the vascular channels at the tip of the papilla causing hyperemia, inflammatory cells with granulocytes, lymphocytes and macrophages, and transformation of the squamous into columnar epithelium causing Barrett's metaplasia or all the histological findings that are common on long-standing or chronic GERD. If GERD is clinically suspected and there is no indication for endoscopy, empiric therapy ranging from lifestyle modifications to a short trial with PPI should be initiated. The GERD diagnosis is assumed in patients who respond to this therapeutic regimen. On the other hand, upper endoscopy is indicated in patients with suspected GERD to evaluate alarm features or abnormal imaging if not performed within the last three months. Management of gastroesophageal reflux disease. Older men who are above 50 years of age with symptoms for more than five years, along with cancerous factors or sudden alarm symptoms like weight loss, anemia, hematemesis, melina, persistent vomiting, and dysphagia or dinophagia should undergo an endoscopy. On endoscopy, if there is esophagitis, Treatment should be according to the diagnosis and a deeper evaluation to understand the underlying cause of esophagitis should be mandated. Some of the most common causes of esophagitis could be pill-induced esophagitis, autoimmune skin disease, Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, eosinophilic esophagitis, and Barrett's esophagus. On endoscopy, if there is no esophagitis, consider testing for achalasia, gastroparesis, nocturnal acid breakthrough, and non-acid reflux disease with an esophageal manometry or impedance testing, and in some cases, gastric scintigraphy. On the other hand, if there are no alarm symptoms or there are no cancer risk factors, and if the symptoms are less than five years in men who are maybe 50 years or less than 50 years, a once daily PPI for two months can be employed as a trial and error therapy. If the symptoms are refractory, switch to a different PPI or increase the PPI dose to twice daily. If the symptoms are controlled, continue persistent therapy, whereas in persistent symptoms, consider endoscopy or esophageal pH monitoring. Certain lifestyle modifications, including dietary modifications, physical therapy, can also help reduce the symptoms of GERD. Small proportions of food and avoiding eating less than three hours before bedtime and avoiding foods with high fat content can help reduce the symptoms of GERD. Weight loss for patients with GERD who are overweight or have had recent weight gain and elevation of the head of the bed in individuals with nocturnal or laryngeal symptoms can be helpful. This can be achieved either by putting 6 to 8 inch blocks under the legs at the head of the bed or a styrofoam wedge under the mattress. Avoiding toxins which triggers esophagitis like nicotine, alcohol, coffee, and certain drugs like calcium channel blockers, diazepam, bisphosphonates, should all be avoided. 
Medical treatment of choice is proton pump inhibitors for at least eight weeks as a once daily therapy in patients who have had no response for the diagnostic evaluation or if a high degree of suspicion for GERD is already present, once daily therapy can be converted into twice daily therapy and the PPI can also be changed. If there's partial response, increase the dose to twice daily therapy or switch to a different PPI. And if there's good response, discontinue the PPIs after eight weeks of therapy. Indications for surgical therapy. There are several indications for surgery in the patient with GERD, like gastrointestinal indications, failed optimal medical management, non-compliance with medical therapy, high volume reflux, benign strictures, severe esophagitis by endoscopy, and Barrett's columnar lined epithelium without severe dysplasia or carcinoma. Symptoms usually resolve in 85% of the cases, but recurrence is quite possible with fund application. The gastric fundus is wrapped around the lower esophagus and secured with stitches to form a cuff, leading to a narrowing of the distal esophagus and the gastroesophageal junction, thereby preventing reflux, as shown here. Nissen's fundoplication is complete fundoplication, and the complications involved are intraoperative damage to the stomach and to the surrounding organs, especially the esophagus, spleen, the lungs, or the pleura sometimes leading to pneumothorax. Another important complication is gas bloat syndrome, which is the inability to belch leading to bloating and an increase in flatulence. Dysphagia, especially to the solids, can also be seen in patients undergoing fund applications. Telescopic phenomenon, otherwise termed as slipped Nissen's fund application, is wherein the esophagus slides out of the wrapped stomach portion. Gastric denervation wherein vagal nerve injury leads to bloating and cardiac complaints resembling Royal Health Syndrome can also be seen in patients undergoing fund applications.